Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in Ireland, when you get a lecture just after lunch, they call it the graveyard shift. <laughs> and they believe that it's a competition of uh, how many people you can make go sleep. So I have a guy here counting, and let's see where it goes, OK? Um, at the very outset, I want to get across to you is not for one minute am I claiming that what we do in Dublin Fire Brigade is the best in the world. Neither am I claiming it will be suitable for what you do. But what I can say, it's the best for us right now. Because fire services around the world are in a general race with developments in the built environment. So the changes that happen in those built environment type of buildings and structures gen generally influence the tactics and strategies we mu must develop. So um, that's where I am uh, living on the east coast, a little island on the east coast of Europe. And I specifically live in Dublin, <coughs> which is on the, uh, sorry, the west coast of Europe for Ireland and the east coast of Europe for Dublin. Um, Dublin Fire Brigade, um, it's, uh, it's been around since 1862. Uh, we have 15 stations, two of them are part-time stations. Um, we have 960 firefighter paramedics, they're dual qualified. Um, it provides both the fire service and the emergency ambulance service and we serve 1.4 million people. Our um, service demand is 130,000 emergency calls a year and 80% of those calls are ambulance based. Um, so that is Dublin, and what I'd like to kind of draw your attention to is the cranes in the background. Um, if you went to Dublin 20 years ago and compared it to now, you would be kind of astonished at the height of the buildings and the sheer volume of buildings. Um, we didn't realise how bad we were at tall and complex fires until at one specific fire called the Metro Fire where everything that could go wrong, did go wrong. And it made us realize that we needed to reflect and think about our performance and really bridge the gap in our skill level to where it should be. So before I dive into that, I was really privileged to spend two days with the local Akali Fire Station. And yesterday I went into the central station in Athens. And I just wanted to tell you my takeaways. I got a huge sense of professionalism, eagerness to learn, and a sense of duty in serving the community. And I mean this honestly, um, I found it inspirational. So it's given me renewed uh, conviction that um, the way we're going is the right way, and I'm absolutely sure you guys are going to lead the world when you apply yourself to any new venture. So the starting point to all this is um, a quote by Peter Drucker. And he says, the relevant question is not simply, what shall we do tomorrow, but rather, what shall we do today in order to get ready for tomorrow? So that was our core understanding of what was required, a changing Dublin that had kind of outstripped our skills. So um, the approach we took with this was quite an academic approach um, in that we did a literature review of every single SOP or SOG available on the planet. Uh, we organized a conference about 10 years ago where we invited experts from around the world to advise us and to tell us the direction we should go. And that's, that was really the springboard for our development of these policies, strategies, and techniques. So the very first thing, and we had some conversations about this earlier, what is a high-rise building? Depending on who you talk to, an FPA say 75 feet. Other people think it's over 50 meters. But our research findings would suggest that the height of the building is not the key consideration. The key considerations are what type of fire occurs in buildings of a particular style, and what skills are necessary for you to deal with those hazards that when they present to you. So in the end, the presentation that, sorry, the definition that we actually chose was the one developed by Ottawa Fire Service in Canada. And they say that 
a structure that is beyond the reach of a fire department aerial uh, equipment because of its height, its setback, or its location. So if you have a 64 meter ladder and you can't drive down a lane to deal with a four story or a five story building, you have no choice but to go offensive. You don't have a defensive capability. So that could become what we call a tall and complex building. And once we applied those metrics, we realized there was a lot of buildings in Dublin that we needed to apply tall and complex strategies and tactics. So we didn't think the problem was really big until we realized what skills we hadn't got. The next thing the Canadians and ourselves would agree on is structures that require an unreasonable evacuation time, structures that pose a significant stack effect or potential for unusual smoke movement. And then the last one is structures where tall and complex tactics are required. So you could be in a three-story building that has a protected stairwell with a dry riser or standpipe, you might call it, that requires all our operations to fundamentally need a new microphone. So you could go to a hospital and your guys have to work off a stairwell, plug into a firefighting uh, dry riser, your command system would be extended and essentially you would be using tall and complex tactics. When you add in the concepts of ventilation systems that are in those buildings, um, smoke management systems, um, the type of systems would incur that a normal approach to firefighting wouldn't work very well. So, Given the variance or different types and function, Dublin Fire Brigade have established three classifications of high rise, or as we call it, tall and complex. The first one is buildings up to 20 meters, only 20 meters, to have systems in place that require us to adopt these tactics. Under 20 meters, they can be commercial buildings, institutional buildings, domestic buildings, shops, shopping centers. The second category are residential buildings over 20 meters, and in this case, they can build to the moon and have one stairwell in Dublin. The UK, Ireland, and I think Singapore are the only countries in the world that allow you to put people into apartments and build as high as you want and have one stairwell. Um, type three is where we have a commercial component to that building. So if we have an open plan element, fire will not behave the same way because there's no compartmentation. So we have a concept called progressive or traveling fire behavior. So in accordance with that, we have developed some core principles um, to deal with these type of structures. So the core principles first, rapid intervention. If you read any of the literature out there, they talk about reflex time. Reflex time is the time that it takes us to act or create an intervention that makes that situation stabilized. A well-trained team pulling up at a tall and complex building could take longer to get water on the fire than it took them to drive from the station to that building. They're the facts. So our core principle is to reduce reflex time. The second principle is protecting occupant means of escape. In other words, so people can leave the building under their own steam. The third principle is the concept of simultaneous fire attack and phased evacuation based on the risk profile of that floor or proximity to the fire. Now, this is fundamental. <clears throat> the concept of stay in place, defend in situ, we have zero confidence in in Dublin. Why? Because the standard of construction is not up to the level where we can support a stay in place engineering strategy. Equally, when a building is new, 
it may achieve that level of confidence for us. But move 60 years down the road. Are the systems still working? Was the building modified? Did someone make a fundamental change to that building without going about it the right way? So we have zero confidence in stay in situ. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down each of those pillars to say what we've done to achieve it. So first of all, rapid intervention. The first thing was to enhance command and control. Now looking at the audience that I have, it strikes me of a lot of operational people who have a really strong handle on command and control. When we started doing uh, the research and the training, our incident commanders had serious issues with command and control in tall and complex. Why? Because they were dependent on radio messages. They couldn't see what people were doing. So what did we do to try and enhance this? Well, the first thing we did was introduce a new concept for Dublin Fire Brigade, and it's called the Immediate Deployment Group. And what that means is the first set of response will take up predetermined tasks. It is our view that there's so much going on at the same time, it's not fair on a human being to try and control all of those elements at the one time. So here's our sequence of deployment. A district officer like me will be in overall command. The first arriving station officer, I think you might call her a captain, is that right? What's a, what's a station officer? Captain? will take up a position in the bridgehead and do reconnaissance. Why do we want a more senior officer up there? If you look at other countries, sending the most junior officer up there, that's where the error chain starts. So the person with the least amount of experience is sending back a size up and a dynamic risk assessment to everyone else and all the actions that happen are dependent on a very inexperienced person's view of the problem. So we don't see that as correct, and we send up an experienced officer. The second arriving officer will take over the lobby sector, essentially to take control of the building systems and to take control of accountability. The third arriving officer will take up a dedicated function of water sector. Let me explain. A dry riser in my country has a capability to produce 1,500 litres of minute, water a minute. A aerial appliance will need a minimum of 1,500 litres a minute to function, and some of them go far higher than that. So from the get-go, we need 3,000 litres of water a minute. That doesn't happen by magic. So we front load the concept of a water sector officer. The aerial appliance will site and carry out the functions as needed, which I'm going to talk about later. And then lastly, a specific appliance from the very start will take up a planning and logistics role. And the idea is that what is going to be the biggest consumable that we will need in a hurry if we're 20 floors up? Anyone want to guess? Air. So it's very hard for firefighters to carry up cylinders carry up all the other equipment. So the planning and logistics guy, the first function is to get additional cylinders up there. Okay, okay, so let's now talk about strategy and tactics. The strategic objectives in our world for tall and complex fires are determine the fire floor as quickly as possible. Why? Because every action that occurs after that will depend on the accuracy of that. And looking at the experience in the room, you know that where the smoke comes out is not necessarily where the fire started. So we need to find out the first point of origin and then determine where we're going to put a bridgehead. Um, the second strategic option, sorry, um, pillar is that every subsequent crew that ascends in that stairwell must independently confirm where they need to go with the lobby sector officer using the automatic fire alarm. Why? Because the error chain of human 
thought processes is based on, well, what they did must be right, so we're going to copy it. <coughs> and then the error continues. So an independent check of the fire floor and the bridgehead. Number three, and super important, protect and secure corridors and stairwells for evacuation of residents and withdrawal of firefighters. Why? Because we don't have the resources to carry everyone down the stairs. So the more people that can leave in a safe stairwell by themselves, the easier our job gets. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to make sure that the stairwells and means of escape remain viable for the entirety of the operation. The fourth principle, gain control of the building system. So the lobby sector will take and make sure we have control over the dry or wet rising mains, the firefighting lift, the fire alarm panel, the smoke control system, and any computer in the area. Oh, we're back, we're back. Is this? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. Um, is there a loose cable? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Okay, so the fourth one is secure and adequate water supply. Anybody? Know Paul Grimwood? I know you know. Um, Paul Grimwood, the NFPA, and some very, very experienced uh, first scientists, I would call them, have indicated what um, a flow rate requirement is. And um, if we don't have that flow rate, we're putting firefighters in difficulty. So the water sector officer is how we're going to do that. And then the next one confine the fire, stop it spreading, extinguish the fire and begin the process of evacuation um, as soon as possible. Now that might seem state-of-the-art. Uh, that's the New York Fire Department from the 1950s. The specific area I would bring your attention to is control the means of escape and make sure they stay functioning. And the last bit, start evacuating as soon as possible. FDNY 70 years ago. It's valid now more than ever. Okay. Tactical priorities. Strategy is the big plan. Tactics is what's happening on the ground. So, get water on the fur quick. We all heard of transitional attack, yeah? Um, ensure that the stairwell lobby is cleared of if it's full of smoke and secured from filling with smoke before making an inter interior attack. That's fundamental. If we arrive and the stairwell is full of smoke, we need to clear that stairwell first before thinking about a fire attack. Um, providing the adequate flow rate we talked about, confine the fire as soon as possible with a rapid intervention, and evacuate the primary and second risk, risk zones as soon as possible. So the primary risk zone is the floor of the fire and the stairwells leading to it. The secondary risk zones are the floor above and below the fire. So you're looking at a phased evacuation. Um, so after doing a task uh, and activity uh, analysis, we saw that there was multiple jobs that had to be done co uh, concurrently, and we worked out then how many people we needed. So for a type one building, we're looking at uh, a district officer, four appliances, one aerial appliance, and a rescue appliance. If we go to a type two, we add another district officer and another appliance. If we go to a type three, we add another, another appliance. Now, that might seem excessive, but from our studies, uh, tall and complex fires are resource heavy. You will run out of resources really quickly. And the reality of it is, those predetermined attendances are for the first half an hour. Um, the metro fire that I talked about at the start, we had 67 firefighters there for three hours. Okay, this is, that's okay. Um, okay, the next thing for a rapid intervention is we've developed a standard high-rise kit. Can you imagine going to the fire floor and you forgot your Halligan tool? 
you can't just go down 20 floors and say, listen, I'll just run out and catch that for you. So there's a specific set of equipment weighing no more than 25 kilos that each firefighter carries up. And every team going up carries a standard kit. So they're independent of each other. They don't need to borrow stuff. Again, to speed up our intervention. This might be a little controversial in some areas in Europe in that our rising mains, dry and wet risers, do not reliably support fog nozzles. An example, a pressure reducing valve on a wet rising main could give out a maximum of five bar. If we run three lengths of 51 mil holes, we will lose another 2.7 bar. So you are never going to get near a five, six or seven bar nozzle inlet pressure to give you the droplet size you would want. The other thing is that when they build a standpipe and it's brand new, it will give you 1500 litres a minute, move forward 10 years and there's rubbish inside it, cigarettes inside it, there's rust inside it, you will get debris within the dry riser that a fog nozzle will most likely become clogged. The next part of our rep rapid intervention is fast hose deployment techniques. In Dublin Fire Brigade, we have a love affair with hose reels. 22 mil hose reels giving about 200 litres a minute. This isn't going to work off a dry riser. So we had to become better at moving bigger hose. There was a little bit of resistance to this at the start, but the way we did it was we looked to our American cousins who have the, the, they've actually the, they designed ergonomic methods to move holes. So let's have a look. We chose the Denver hose load. We looked at Cleveland, doesn't work reliably at low, low, low pressure. We tried bags from Australia. We tried bags from Canada. None of them worked reliably for us. So let's have a look at the Cleveland and what you're seeing is the way it would be deployed if firefighters were going upstairs and you can see it's a, a form of a flake and as we we come to the end of one piece of hose the firefighter has a drop point the other thing about the Denver is it allows a lot of flexibility so we can place this and turn it into a flaked hose depending on the available size on the fire floor And if we want to use the Denver in an other situation like uh, industrial fires, we can deploy up to three lines of 22.5 meter each simultaneously. So that's super effective. And it means the pump operator can be doing that where the guys are doing forcible entry. Now you might say, what happens if we have a narrow stairwell, a narrow lobby? Well, the beauty of the Denver conversion to coil is this. This is a Denver and we can place it on the ground and we can get all of the advantages of the Cleveland by doing this technique. It's called conversion to coil. The pressure of water you will see filling this is 2.5 bar. We train for appalling pressures. So the advantage here is they can actually put it up against the wall so people can continue to escape while we're laying holes. So you can see the water pressure is really bad. It's by design. And when it's done, the firefighter can lean it against the wall and simply advance the hose. So we found it to be very easy to use, very easy to carry, because you'll see in a minute the guy is carrying it, and very easy to deploy if you've got very difficult spaces to work in. Okay, so the next rapid intervention tool we're using is transitional attack. Getting water on the fire as quickly as possible from the outside. When you think about it, you're going to have teams assembling their equipment, climbing up many, many stairs maybe, if the fire lift is not working. So we need to do something about fire spread rapidly. So we will do that from the ground. With a lay flat hose, you'll hit five floors. With a TL, it depends on the capabilities of that unit. But transitional attack is something we encourage. So. That brings us to the role of aerial appliances. In Dublin, an aerial appliance was always viewed as an almost when the fur has gone through the roof. And it's almost kind of, look, it's really bad. Get the guys out, we're going to use water using an aerial. Not anymore. 
An aerial appliance is seen as an offensive tool to apply transitional uh, attack techniques. And even though the, the flow is huge, they, they don't do more than three second applications and they simply move the ladder or the HP to one side and they keep view of the fire. So the, the aerial appliance role and scope has changed. The use of floor below nozzles. Now, if you have the highest aerial in the world, they'll always build higher. There'll always be a floor higher than that. So the use of the floor below nozzle like this one, we found really good because it allowed us to put water on even if the TO could not access it, which is going to be really important when we talk about specific types of fires. The next pillar to our process is the concept of protecting stairwells to allow people to escape under their own uh, steam, so to speak. So the tool of choice is for us is smoke cordon, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because Michael is going to spot, speak in detail, but it is now on every appliance in Dublin Fire Brigade, and it's our view that you can't do high rise without a smoke cordon. Okay, so what, where do we put the smoke cordon? Well, we put it on the stairwell door which means that when we go in and start opening doors to lay holes, the stairwell is going to remain clear of smoke. We, we bring up a minimum of three smoke curtains. The second one would go on the lift shaft because it's one of the best ways of spreading smoke in a building, a lift shaft. Um, and then we will also put the next smoke curtain on the apartment door. So you can see there's a very prescriptive approach that we're going to try and keep the smoke as confined as possible to let people escape. So, the next techniques that we've advocated is the concept of fire isolation. This was a little bit foreign to us, but what it means in plain language is there are some situations where we will isolate the fire by keeping the door closed and evacuate all around it and place the evacuation higher priority than actually entering that apartment and putting out the fire. The next element in terms of protecting people's means of escape is using tactical ventilation. Again, I would suggest PPV is a tool that you cannot do tall and complex without. And you've also got to factor in that these buildings have complicated ventilation systems that we have to learn how to master. Okay, so the third pillar is simultaneous fire attack and phased evacuation. So, just to confirm with you guys, we don't do stay in place. It's not an option. So our approach will be to, once we have um, a smoke curtain up as I've described, and the second and third curtain, and we have people going in to attack a fire, we will start evacuating that floor. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, engineers in the UK and Ireland and North America designed a layered approach to fire safety provisions within a building. So they say, if we've got fire-resistant walls, if we have a fire alarm system, if we have a sprinkler system, if we have um, smoke control mechanisms, we don't need to move everyone out of that building if there's a fire. So the people whose apartment went on fire should, should leave, but everyone else should stay in place. Um, we don't believe it, <laughs> okay? We don't run with it at all. Um, so in terms of these risk zones, I mentioned them already. Primary is the floor of the fire and the stairwells leading to it. Secondary is above the fire or below the fire. So let's get down to how we approached identifying our, our training needs. And I just want to re resume my reference to the way an engineer looks at a building. An engineer will look to a building and believe that all the features that were on the design are going to stay working for the life of the building. That all the features were on the design were actually per perfectly constructed and installed by the builders. So to be honest with you, it's a world of make-believe because a building never stays the same over its life and not every builder does the job that they're supposed to do. So in terms of the engineering approach to assuming scenarios in high rise are tall and complex, we don't think that way, we think that way. 
Homer Simpson lives in that building. He's going to wedge open his fire door. He's going to do silly things. He's going to behave in a way that's not civic spirited. And the scenarios that we're going to talk about in a minute really come about from human behavior. So, the assumptions. We're going to talk about single apartment first, first residential. The first one is the stairwell when we arrive is clear of smoke and the attack corridor leading to the apartments is also clear of smoke. This is the perfect scenario. The building is working well. The second one, when we arrive, the stairwell is clear. But for some reason, the corridor or the lobby leading to that apartment is full of smoke. So you can think about this. People took off their door closers. People wedged open doors. Or the building is that old that the closer isn't closing properly. And the area just outside the apartment is full of smoke. The, the third scenario is a building that's really, really badly managed. Um, you can think of a recent New York fire, which falls this, into this category, where the stairwell is full of smoke, but also is the corridor leading to the apartment. Fourth scenario is a wind-driven fire. I'm sure we've all heard of it. Uh, fifth scenario is a commercial open plan fire. And the sixth one is building failure. We're going to talk about that in detail. Uh, the Grenfell tragedy kind of put this into horrible reality for all of us. Scenario seven is an underground car park fire, which you might think, what's that got to do in tall and complex? It'll become clear as we go on. Okay, how are we gonna deal with these scenarios? Okay, so we'll do the first scenario. Stairwell is clear. The corridor leading up to the apartment is clear. So here's the important bits. The fire is currently confined to the apartment of origin. It's really important that whatever we do doesn't make that worse. So we have developed what's called fast, frugal heuristics. Fancy word, forgive me for being so silly with the name. These were designed for doctors to make diagnoses. And the idea is they're simple yes, no concepts to support decision making. And as we go through it, and I'm not going to hold up your day doing it, I'll give the, all, anyone that wants this, you can have everything. Um, it allows officers to make quick, fast, frugal decisions of how to deal with that scenario. Scenario two, we talked about the stairwell is clear, the corridor is full of smoke, and we have a slightly different decision tree. Um, the third one, this is getting more tricky, is the stairwell is full of smoke and so is that corridor. And the key feature of this tactic is your team, you can call it a stairwell protection team or a rapid ascent team, they must get up to the door that's causing that problem, the stairwell that's filling with smoke because of a door that's open. They must close the door, put a smoke curtain on that door, and ventilate that stairwell. So that's a really important one. And again, the decision algorithm actually helps them do that. The fourth one, the wind-driven fire. Um, I'm sure you guys are well read, and you can see the problems with these situations where um, there's vents open and the fire is being blowing like a blowtorch into an area that puts people in danger. So in this situation, the bottom left indicates what a corridor would look like when it's exposed to wind impact. There's very, very low fire load in a corridor. And look at the damage caused by a wind impacted event. Needless to say, if there's a firefighter or a victim in that space, your survivability is going to be poor. So what are we thinking about when we're going to deal with these scenarios? Well, what we're going to try and do is change conditions within the wind impacted compartment by an external approach. So that could be a turntable ladder, on the right, a floor below branch, the bottom right, a fog nail. We drill a hole from next door. So, in terms of wind-driven fire, if the attack corridor is clear up to the apartment, we will put two small curtains on the affected apartment and we will evacuate everyone off that floor. While that's going on, the guys are doing their transitional attack and it mightn't take long. Um, the other thing that we would do, we would break into an apartment 
on the wind side of the building as a refuge area. And the idea is that if things went really, really bad, that the guys would get into that apartment and close the door. Um, and again, as I said, we're going to control the conditions from outside. Um, the other and even worse scenario is if you have a wind impacted fire and the door of that apartment is open and this blowtorch effect is coming from the outside window right through the apartment and into the corridor. In that situation, we will not enter that corridor and we'll have an outside attack on the fire and only then when we've controlled it will the guys enter the floor of the fire. What they will do in the meantime is evacuate anyone they can in the secondary risk zone. When the fire is controlled, they'll move forward, smoke curtain on the apartment door, and evacuate the primary risk zone. Right, so there's, again, a flow chart to help people make decisions. Scenario five, um, it's uh, an open plan fire. So the key here is flow rate. So let me give you some numbers. A dry riser in UK standards, and we use UK standards, is one rising main for every 900 square meters. If you had 900 square meters of an open plan, you would need between four and a half and 5,000 liters of water. A dry riser will give you 1,500. You will be grossly underflowing a progressive or a traveling fire. So the key here is fast intervention. And we're looking at, if we can get on the floor, to think about things doing uh, a direct attack, a flanking attack from one stairwell, or from an, a second stairwell like that there. But we'd be fully aware, if we don't get that quick, we're going to lose the floor. And it will become a controlled burn. Okay, if there's a wind-driven fire in an open plan office block, okay, we're not going in. We're not going to do it. We're going to try to do everything from outside. Okay, this one um, we've learned really from horrible experiences internationally, building failure. So let me define what that is. The, IC, in, the officer in charge will implement a full emergency evacuation, not a phased evacuation, if any of the following are observed. Internal failure of compartmentation. Failure of firefighting facilities. A fire and products of combustion spreading rapidly across multiple floors, either on the inside or the outside of the building. Fire in external cladding. I'm sure that sounds familiar. Um, in incident commanders will also consider the potential for total collapse of a steel frame building if fire has control of two or more floors. The other thing that... Um, uh, an emergency evacuation might occur if we don't have the resources to deal with it. We don't have enough people available. So, I remind you of a building failure. And what we're trying to do is equip with officers with decision-making tools to consider a full emer emergency evacuation before things get that bad. Okay, so how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to initially move people from the primary risk zone, in other words, people closest to the origin of the fire, the victim on the fire floors, the victims in stairwells, then the secondary risk zones, and we'll apply a three-floor rule. So we'll evacuate victims on three floors directly above the fire, three floors below the fire, and then the rest of them. Now, I'm not going to try and fool you into believing that this tactic is going to be wonderful in every situation because worldwide we don't actually know we don't actually know because they haven't put enough time into this yet but we need to have a plan when we arrive if we have to get everyone out of that building what sequence are we going to do it in and just remember if you have a stack effect unusual smoke movement that could go down instead of up that could change your priorities of who you move first okay Underground car park for us, sometimes we forget them in terms of tall and complex, but basically we need to think, do we have the capability of laying a length of hose up to the car dry because it's only localised car for Or if there's more than one car involved and the situation in the car park is untenable, do we need to charge the hose in the stairwell and do an attack from the stairwell with charge line? 
So the big tier here is that you know these underground car parks can have multiple stairwells. So really picking the right stairwell nearest to the car is, is the big one because we've made some mistakes here where we ended up with um, a big journey for to make holes. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So if you think about a, a car park and someone has wedged open a, a door, suddenly you have smoke filling the stairwell and now you've put people in danger several floors above the car park. So if you think about the strategy that we talked about at the start, your first strategic objective in this case is to create means of escape and to maintain means of escape. So we'd put a smoke curtain on the car park door, we'd use a fan to clear that stairwell, and we've achieved one of our primary strategic, strategic objectives. Okay, so just to get quickly, how did we implement all of this? You guys know you've 1,000 firefighters plus, you've 4,000 firefighters plus. Changing anything is difficult, is difficult. So what we did is this. We applied an instructional design model. In other words, using the best concepts of adult education. Specifically, it's known as the ADI model. And we developed a curriculum. A curriculum of training for firefighters, officers at different levels. And in that curriculum, we put in the learning outcomes, the psychomotor and cognitive competencies that are necessary. And it also says how we deliver the training and how we evaluate the training. The next thing, we have a manual, something to refer to. The third thing is we developed an SOG. Now, guys, SOGs, they're quite difficult at times. I wrote this SOG in initially, and it was 20,000 words long. Can I ask anybody just with a nod of the head, any of you guys going to read 20,000 words? Not a hope. So we realized we need to change the way we did SOG. So here's what we do. We put a PowerPoint presentation that the guys can do online. We have a manual, and we also have tactical aid memoirs. And each chapter of the SOG is actually done with a learning intervention. And even with an experienced or an inexperienced officer in the station, you simply guide the firefighters towards the online learning. So the SOG actually becomes a learning intervention rather than something that somebody reads and you take a box and you pretend that they know it. Um, so there are the three elements that support each chapter. So it's integrating training and SOGs. Last of all, um, I talked about a bridgehead. I talked about a lobby sector. I talked about a water sector. I talked about planning and logistics, and I talked about instant command. How on earth are you going to remember all this? So what we've done is exactly what they do with pilots. So when you get onto your 737, do you think he remembers everything or she remembers? Not a chance. They go through checklists. So we've developed short checklists that the officers can refer to. That when I say, will you do the bridgehead sector for me? And you go, oh, no. You can quickly refer to this and give you an idea what you must do. If you go through the SOGs across the world, they talk about all these sectors, but they don't say what people should do in those sectors. And we've tried to correct that. OK. So I'm just going to talk about hose management. Um, we were bad at this, moving big hose. You hear people talking about, it has to be a 120 kilo fighter from America that's in the gym and he's doing steroids to do this. You're going to look at a team of female firefighters, and they're going to show you how we move hose. This is 51 mil hose. Each length of hose, when it's full of water, weighs about 75 kilos. So you can see them using the Denver, and they're actually setting it up in a simulated corridor. We don't have a high-rise training center, so we've developed systems to learn how to manage hose using improvisation. So they're ready to enter the building, and the hoses are charged. Minimum, minimum made down at three, and here's what they do. So we're using smooth bars, and you'll see them using a clamp slide, which uses the big muscles of your body and a leverage action to move the hose. The follow-up firefighters are doing rowing actions, so when the hose is going around friction points, that it's managed really efficiently. So you're seeing a group of small firefighters move big holes super efficiently and pretty successfully. The next way we implemented it, this is the same team. 
we don't believe that tactics should be taught only when you're an officer. So you could be seven years or five years in the job. We start a three-day course for, off, for firefighters, recruits, or newbies, where that they learn all of the tactics that I've talked about, and they do tabletop exercises using tactical aid memoirs, fast frugal heuristics, to understand all the different things that they're expected to do. This has been a really successful program. The other thing that we're finding is XVR, or simulation, is the way to go to train officers. People don't necessarily want us to use their high-rise buildings to play with. So XVR is a good system. Um, and then when they do let us do exercises, we've completed, since the start of this program, 26 full-scale, tall and complex, where we tested all the sectors, all the tactics, all the tack aids, all the decision support algorithms to see if they work. And we made changes. So these are just pictures of guys carrying pretty heavy hose up in a very ergonomic way using the Denver. And um, just to summarize, um, what did we do to get ready for tomorrow? Well, we spoke to everybody who knew more about it than we did. And there was a lot of people who knew more about it than we did. Um, we carried out an academic literature review of international best practices. Sure, no problem. You can have the presentation. This one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. Apologies. So, again, you're using the harness on the BA set as a mechanism to ergonomically carry hose. You can also put it over your shoulder. The more macho firefighters like that for the camera shots. Um, are you happy? Yeah. So in summary, um, we spoke to people who knew what they were talking about. Um, we did a literature review of every SOG we could get our hand on. And we undertook a gap analysis. Now this is the hard part for an organization like ours. We had to figure out where we are right now and what we're really crap at. And what we call them is development opportunities. So you can't, you can't use crap really. And then what we figured out was how we're going to get where we needed to go. We identified a range of realistic scenarios that we could train against, both for command and deployment. We developed a comprehensive range, a range of strategic and tactical solutions. We undertook took multiple full-scale exercises to see if this will work. And now we're in the process of rolling this out. We've about 50% of the brigade done. COVID put a big stop on a lot of training, I'm afraid, but we're getting there. And then this is the last part. Through learning, we actually recreate ourselves. Uh, through learning, we become able to do something that we were never able to do. We were never able to do this before this policy, and we think we're starting to get good at it now. Um, at the, in the end, it's about serving the public. It's a duty of, uh, that we have to them to be the best we can. And I'd love to tell you that we're there, but we're not. We're getting there. So um, thank you so much um, for listening. I know it was fairly fast. Quick one, if I may. Sure. Uh, uh, did you consider integrating uh, robotics into your uh, high rise uh, tactics? We've seen in uh, France, in uh, UK, in the US, uh, uh, robot units, uh, tractor mine uh, driven units. Uh, in order to attack the fire where humans are not supposed to go or would be very hazardous to go. Thank I'm, you. I'm going to give you a real honest answer. We don't have the money. Um, 
And I'm not being flippant. I apologise if I sound flippant. Um, we did contact a company in Ireland that make robots for bomb disposal. And um, they were looking for money that most fire brigades could only dream about. And the problem that they had, and they admitted this to us, if you put a hose on the end of a robot and the robot goes around two corners, the friction increases exponentially and it mightn't be able to pull it. Equally, um, we're not sure that they have a robot yet for that will deal with a wind-driven fire and stay robust and survivable. So we, we didn't have the money to do So what we are in, in investing in now is um, cheap drones, you know, the really tiny 200 gram ones. And I think situational awareness is really important in this. And I think our money would probably be better spent on drones because they're, they're getting to a point now where you can buy multiples of them reasonably cheaply. But robots, we don't have the money, sorry. We don't have the money. Dr sorry, dr drones, uh, aer aerial drones, sorry, my accent. Because we have fire balls. Yeah, yeah, for boats. Fire balls. It's a ball. Uh, inside there is uh, a dust, you know. Oh, all oh, right, yeah. Like dry powder. And, and uh, when we have uh, above or uh, less uh, 70 degrees uh, temperature, they explode. Oh, I've seen them on YouTube, yeah. yeah. We haven't, I'm going to be honest, we, we hadn't considered them. Um, I'm not saying they're a bad idea because I don't know, uh, but we haven't, we, we never thought of it. All right. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a nice time to have a question for you. Okay. Uh, what, what is your opinion about uh, rescue and uh, put the fire off at the same time? Because here in Greece, uh, the most common approach, we have... Uh, in a fire, it's to go uh, for a rescue and for put out the fire at the same time. Is that wrong? I will never. I think tell. it's wrong because we do it here in Greece. I will tell you that I'll never tell you what's right or wrong. I can only okay. give an opinion what's right for me. Ah, right. So I'm being a politician, okay? But um, what I would say in this, tall and complex is different. So, yeah, it's so, different, so yeah. let's separate what might happen in domestic fire. Let's say we have a wind-driven fire, potentially, because you have a spotter outside, there's a, there's a strong wind blowing in, the window's broken, and the compartment door is closed, right? Now, if that was a fully developed, not talking about a little fire, a big fire in that room, if we opened that door, we would be putting the firefighters in immediate danger, and the victims on that floor also in immediate danger. So our approach would be, in that situation, a fire isolation strategy. So we would put two smoke curtains on the affected apartment. The guys would hopefully be able to deal with it from the outside with an aerial appliances. No, and the enemy is the oxygen. And the, yeah, and the guys will clear, evacuate every other apartment on that floor. So in that case, we are not attacking the fire. We're, we're doing a fire isolation strategy. Now let's give another version of it. If it wasn't a wind-driven fire, the use of transitional attack means that we've a rapid intervention on that fire even before we get up the stairs. So mm. I'm actually agreeing with both thought processes here. There's some situations, like a domestic fire, that getting the fire out will get, make the other problems go away. I, I wouldn't disagree. But there's other situations where the fire is so bad in that compartment that moving people off that danger zone is a better option. Yeah, so it's I kind agree. of more, it's a bit flexible, if I'm being honest, rather than I agree. prescriptive. Thank you very much.